Christmas. Um, I, know, I know there's a lot, a lot of people say that this is a racist thing and all that kind of thing, but I, I don't see that. I just see ordinary people who are just fed up and don't seem to have a voice. There was a counter-protest, far fewer numbers um, in their hundreds rather than their thousands, stand up to racism. Uh, that was the general banner for those counter-protesters. Um, carrying banners with slogans such as no to racism, no to hatred, we spoke to some of their supporters. For me personally as well, to feel uh, more hopeful and to feel like I'm not by myself whenever I'm, you know... London roars as a big rally against migrants gathers momentum. The capital city of the UK recently witnessed one of the largest protests against immigration policies in recent years. Thousands of people took to the streets voicing their concerns and frustrations over the government's handling of immigration. The protest highlighted deep-seated issues and a growing sense among certain groups who believe that the current policies are detrimental to the country. That has caused friction with locals who feel that their concerns are being ignored. At Saturday's march, some locals were among the 200 to 300 people who marched through Skegness to stage a rally in a local park under the watchful eye of the police. But it was clear that some in the crowd didn't appreciate our presence. <laughs> Oh, make me two streets where you know. Don't you take us for fools! We know they are not refugees. They are illegal immigrants. The march was attended by far-right groups from outside Skegness. One of those was Patriotic Alternative, a small group led by a former leading activist in the British National Party. And the group made leading speeches at the event. At this time of year, not a lot should be going on in the coastal resort of Skegness. Facing the North Sea, this seaside town is famously bracing, even more so in late February. But Skegness is one of a number of towns and cities, including holiday resorts, that the Home Office is using to house asylum seekers. There are around 220 asylum seekers housed in the town of 22,000. Some locals and businesses are concerned about the effect that the use of this seafront accommodation could have on the local economy and the town's image. Both the threes, 33. It's eyes down at the local social club where the punters are chasing a full house. But the housing of asylum seekers is something everyone is aware of. We think that we're being put on with, this, with the amount of the asylum seekers what we've got. We're not saying we don't want any. But there is a lot. This should be shared out a bit better. And that sounds terrible, doesn't it? I don't mean it to. The issue has been building locally for months. In November, a usually poorly attended council meeting became very rowdy. I'm the mayor's chaplain, so I turned up to bless the council. And there's usually 15, 20 people in there in the public spaces. Well, there were, there were considerably more than that. And it very quickly degenerated into people just shouting and bawling and being quite unpleasant. So the meeting was abandoned and the mayor and the town clerk and the councillors left. But the majority of people at that meeting, I would say, were not, not local. I know a lot of the local people and there were accents and people there I'd never seen before. At the local Anglican church, St Matthew's, churchgoers are celebrating the beginning of Lent, but it seems everyone in the town is aware of the asylum controversy. The peace of the Lord be always with you. The rector of Skegness, Richard Holden, has seen the tensions develop over the last few months firsthand. I think if it, it's going to affect local businesses, I think that's a legitimate concern. So it, our economy is based on holiday makers. So if that's damaged, that damages the town. So I think that's a legitimate concern. And what's not legitimate? I think it's not legitimate to say that they're coming and they're standing outside the school gates, that they are uh, going into the local nightclubs and being a nuisance, or that they're unpleasant to anybody. Uh, I've never found them unpleasant. You do see them walking around, and they walk around in twos and threes. And I think... <laughs> 
when people have actually been aggressive to them, I think it's probably sensible to walk around in twos and threes. The asylum seekers we spoke to did not want to speak on camera. One told us the police visited them at the hotels to brief them ahead of the protest. Businesses in Skegness want a policy rethink. It's the, the rally was organised through social media with platforms like Facebook and Twitter playing a crucial role in mobilising supporters. Organisers used hashtags and event pages to spread the word, ensuring a large turnout. The event's success demonstrated the power of digital activism in bringing together like-minded individuals to advocate for a common cause. Participants came from various parts of the country, united by their belief that stricter immigration controls are necessary to protect protect the nation's interests. As the crowd gathered in central London, chants of we want our country back echoed through the streets. Protesters carried banners and placards with slogans expressing their dissatisfaction with the current immigration policies. The atmosphere was charged with passionate speeches and fervent appeals for change. Many participants expressed concerns about the impact of immigration on jobs, housing and public services. They argued that the influx of migrants was straining resources and making it harder for British citizens to access essential services. This is a very local protest. The traffic thunders by RAF Scampton. People here have been campaigning for a year to stop the Home Office, turning it into accommodation for 2,000 asylum seekers. A year in now. Pretty permanent setup, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> this is a sort of home. Sarah Carter and others take turns to stay here for days at a time. A permanent protest. You've got a whole living area, beds at the back. Yeah, so dining area because we, we like to make it feel a little bit homely because, yeah. I mean, like I say, the guys are away from home for a long time. The locals, like Sarah, had to contend with another group turning up to hijack their cause. Outsiders, far right nationalists. The main group were sort of pretty far right, and then there, there were people there that maybe weren't quite as aware of situation that we're supporting them. Aside from just the sort of, like you say, the violence and all that, in terms of the image more generally, do you think it gets in the way if people think, well, actually protesting against this site here, because of those people, that's a far-right position rather than just a, a legitimate political position? So we've worked really hard to keep a clean campaign. I get called far left, I get called far right, depending on who I'm having the conversation with. Fights broke out and the police were called out regularly. Sarah says she and her husband were assaulted by men wearing balaclavas. Down here is actually a separate camp, and this is the thing, when you have these sorts of protests, this sort of topic, you get different groups with different agendas. The far right have gone now. Camps like these, a separate site with watchtowers looking over, are back in the hands of Gary, a retail warehouse worker currently out of employment. I don't see how this place can really help, because it's not like they can get them here and then process them, because they're not... How many have they processed so far? They've lost low. How many have lost? It's, it's just going to cause problems. Our analysis of new figures from advocacy group Hope Not Hate, shared exclusively with Sky News, shows how protests like these are becoming a new battleground for the far right. There's been this big surge in anti-migrant protests like this one over the last year, but that contains multitudes. It can be legitimate political protests. There's also fears that it can be hijacked by right-wing groups. The demonstration in RAF Scampton is just one of many across the UK. There are 275 anti-migrant events in 2023. 159 of those were visits, where people try and gain access to hotels where migrants are being held. 116 were demonstrations, a 13-fold increase on the year before. We're doing a social media report, and we've been told that the hotel is being used to house migrants. The tactics seem to be shifting. Last year, there was a drop in visits, like this one from Britain First, and a big increase in public demonstrations like these. This one organised by Patriotic Alternative, the far-right organisation responsible for most anti-migrant protests last year. Just because they organised it, though, doesn't mean everyone marching here is a member or even believes in their wider nationalist cause. The far right may also feel more confident organising public protests because their language, their symbols are becoming more mainstream. 
One of the key speakers at the rally was Tommy Robinson, a well-known figure in the anti-immigration movement. Robinson's speech resonated with the crowd as he highlighted what he sees as the failures of the government to address the issues posed by unchecked immigration. He emphasized the need for stricter border controls and more rigorous vetting processes to ensure that those entering the country do not pose a threat to national security. Robinson's rhetoric struck a chord with many in the audience who cheered and applauded his calls for action. <coughs> um, hello, um, I'm from Tower Hamlets and I was, you know, quite well informed about the protests that the EDL wanted to do through Tower Hamlets. One of the biggest reasons why that protest was, you know, so opposed in our borough was because it would have created even bigger divisions between the Muslims and the EDL who claim to represent the rest of Britain. Well, you said it yourself. You said that this is a Muslim problem. The Muslim community needs to to fix this problem on their own. Like, you know, the non-Muslim community can't fix this for us. And that's what we have to do. But then you have documentaries like the Stacey uh, Dooley documentary that goes up to the most radical is, um, Islamic preacher, Anjum Chowdhury, and then interviews them. What did she expect to find if she went to, like, you know, a protest or a, a talk with the most radical preachers at, at its helm. Of course you will find extremism there, of course you will find problems. Every time the Muslim community tries to step up to this, we're brandished as, you know, supporting these, these extremist speakers, but that's, why do they get so much limelight? Where are the normal Muslims? When we try to speak, our airtime is taken by these extremists, and you cause those divisions, well, maybe not so much now, but your involvement with the EDL made these divisions even larger. You know, your protest, had it gone along, it would have helped, in fact, people like Anjum Chowdhury, they could have used that as fuel and food to encourage more innocent um, youngsters who are Muslim to see, he would have, you know, gone out there and said, look, the EDL came to our hometown and they tried to spread hatred. Sure, your intentions may have been good, but when you brandish yourselves as, you know, you sort of make it tribal when you create groups like the EDL. And then that's what the extremists want. So my question is, after, all, after saying all of that, is do you finally admit that your involvement with the EDL actually, in the long run, helped out these um, extremists? Um, these extremists don't need much help. Yeah? We've got probably three times as many British Muslims fighting for ISIS than fighting for the British Army. I wouldn't really say that it's played that big a factor in the ideology that is resulting in what we see as the cancer that is ISIS. We talk about Tower Hamlets and us coming there would have created tensions and that's why we shouldn't have been allowed there. The problem is, they're allowed to walk through my town centre. Yeah? No one stops them. And this is what we see, yeah? When we talk about... Anjum Chowdhury and his group actually protest outside Westminster Cathedral. Inside was not a thousand Christian men, inside was families. The reason why we want to come to Tower Hamlets, let's look at the reason why we wanted to go. Lufthansa Rahman. Everything we said and the reasoning why we wanted to go, I sat in custody and watched a Panorama documentary. It was everything we were saying. Eric Pickles has just put it into special measures. In, in, in Tower Hamlets, you have a, the mayor who was kicked out of the Labour Party for his extremist links. You then have him in charge of a billion pounds budget of taxpayers' money. And if the Muslim community, you have 30% of Tower Hamlets is Muslim. The entire mayor and his committee are Muslim. It's not representative at all. If you want to look at where the funding's gone, because we've done it, we looked at the trail of the funding. All funding to any moderate Muslim group, any decent groups has been siphoned and taken away and the funding siphoned off to madrasas and that's what taxpayers money's funding. The rally also attracted a significant media presence with journalists and cameras capturing the event for national and international audiences. This coverage helped amplify the message of the protesters bringing their concerns to a wider audience. However, it also drew criticism from those who opposed the anti-immigration stance. Counter-protesters and human rights groups argued that the rally promoted xenophobia and intolerance, calling for more compassionate and inclusive approaches to immigration.
Despite the controversy, the size and energy of the rally underscored the depth of feeling among those who participated. Many protesters shared personal stories of how they believed immigration had negatively affected their lives and communities. They spoke of increased competition for jobs, pressure on housing and overburdened public services. For these individuals, the rally was an opportunity to voice their frustrations and demand change from policymakers. From a group of anti-racism protesters. The Football Lads Alliance try to break through. They are supposedly here to peacefully demonstrate against the rape of women and children by Muslim gangs. But it doesn't turn out to be peaceful. The Football Lads Alliance was formed by a football hooligan to unite supporters from different clubs against Islam. Its Facebook page has been criticised for racist content and the group has since renamed itself the Democratic Football Lads Alliance. So who are these people? None of us are racist. I'm an EDL member. I'm a Tommy Robinson boy. I'm sick of the corrupt government telling us lies, blacking out. They're, they're, they're doing blackouts on news media. Look what's happening in Paris, France, Germany, all Sweden. That, all things that look, were reported. Look, on. all things that no, were they reported, weren't reported on, on correctly. They weren't reported on correctly. Are you from what? Sky News. Sky News. Sky News. Yeah. Oh, the biggest liars out there. Yeah. So why don't you report accurate news? Why don't you report about all the rapes that are going on, all the what Islamic terrorism that's going? You know full well what's well, going. We, on. we have reported on terrorist attacks. And we have reported on what's what? been going on in so Chelford. Why, why, and do, why do you label people? Cities. How else would you know? Why well, do you label people? Why do you label people? Why do you call us racist? Why do you call us racist? We asked the counter protesters why they think the group is racist. What's your problem with these guys? They're racist! Why? They say they're just protesting against rape. They do, yeah, but they need a moral cover, don't they? We stand with the victims of rape who could be any colour from any religion or um, any nationality. They're only interested in having a go at Muslims. That's a new Economic concerns were a major theme of the protest. Participants argued that the current immigration policies were putting undue strain on the economy. They claimed that the influx of migrants migrants was driving down wages and making it harder for British workers to find employment. Some also expressed fears that immigrants were taking advantage of the welfare system, placing additional burdens on taxpayers. These economic arguments were central to the protesters' calls for stricter immigration controls and a re-evaluation of current policies. Another significant aspect of the rally was the focus on cultural and social issues. Many protesters expressed concerns about the impact of immigration on British culture and values. They argued that the large number of migrants entering the country was leading to cultural fragmentation and a loss of national identity. Some cited examples of cultural practices and beliefs that they felt were incompatible with British values, calling for measures to ensure better integration of immigrants into society. This cultural dimension added another layer to the protesters' grievances, highlighting the complexity of the immigration debate. What's the connection? How did you and Tommy Robinson come about? Yeah, we're both from Luton, so we both know each other and we've always kind of known each other. And I've always understood his patriotism and his desire to have the UK a Christian country and with full of English people. I don't think that's a bad thing. I don't think it's ever bad to be patriotic about the place you're born from. But um, obviously, I completely disagree with him on Islam now. At the time, I kind of, I'm not going to say I agreed with him, but I understood his points. But uh, I really look forward to having a conversation with Tommy. That'll be a really interesting podcast because I think he he has a lot to learn still, I believe. Let me say this in a very 
diplomatic way. He talks about, you know, the indoctrination of children and how the country's failing and all these things. And he, he, he's trying to find the opposite force to contest these things. And the opposite force to evil is always going to be good, which is God. And I'd like to think he believes in God, but I guess he's a Christian, which is fine. But if the Christian church has no teeth, if the Christian God isn't feared, how can it be God? How can you have a God you can mock? How can you mock God and nothing happen? How's that God? Is that the God you believe in? It's not the God I believe in. So I think he's going to have to accept that there's a logic fail somewhere in his thinking. If he wants an, a good force to oppose evil and he accepts that that must be God, then the God must be powerful. It can't be a weak God. So how can you say it's not as long? But we'll see. We'll talk to him about it. It'll be mm. interesting. It'll be an interesting conversation. And I'm not here to convert anybody either. That's not my intention. But yeah, Tommy's saying a lot of the problems with England is Islam. And maybe for a time, I would maybe thought he had a point when it came to patriotism and that kind of thing. But I, I must disagree with him because it's the Muslims who are protesting against the indoctrination of children. It is the Christians that put him in jail. Muslims didn't put him in jail. Christians put him in jail. Yeah, I look forward to talking to Tommy. I don't want to give away all my talking points now, but uh, it was the white Christian judge that put him in jail. The rally also raised questions about the role of law enforcement in managing such large-scale protests. Police presence was heavy, with officers working to maintain order and ensure the safety of both protesters and the public. There were some tense moments, particularly when counter-protesters attempted to confront the rally participants. However, the event remained largely peaceful, thanks in part to the efforts of the police to keep the two groups separated. The presence of law enforcement highlighted the challenges of balancing the right to protest with the need to maintain public order. As the rally concluded, many participants expressed hope that their voices would be heard by policymakers. They called for immediate action to address their concerns, emphasizing that the current approach approach to immigration was unsustainable. While the rally was just one event, it reflected broader sentiments within certain segments of the population. The protesters vowed to continue their efforts using social media and other tools to keep the pressure on the government. Yeah, this is going to happen to a Jewish school, I guarantee you. Mm -hmm. They took control of a school when I was probably 2019 or something. That was where? This was in Chechnya in Russia. Yeah, okay, I remember so, the story. And what happened was the parents were all outside the school and all the Muslim jihadists are inside the school with their pupils, with their children. Mm. And then they start butchering them and, and killing them. And I remember watching the parents drop to their knees and they're screaming, yeah? And I remember watching it thinking, what, what is this, what has, this isn't one man that's gone in and done this. This is a whole group of people. So what, and then I had to understand what brings someone to do that. And two weeks later, I saw an interview in a chicken shop in my hometown of Luton with a man called Saif al-Islam, which translates as Sword of Islam. He was second in command of al Majradin, the group yeah, who had, whose head office is in my town. And I saw him saying an attack like that would be justified in a British school. And that was my wake up. I said, who's this man? And I looked him up. Who's his group? And I looked up who they were. And then I looked up Omar Bakri. And then I started understanding their ideology and trying to work out. And then for me, these are a danger. Yeah. So then I organised and I looked at, and they used to have a stall set up. So we have a, a Don Miller's Bakery, a famous, it's like your Tim Hortons. Yeah. We have a bakery chain in Luton Town Centre. And every Saturday, this terrorist group are there openly promoting hatred. Yeah? Just openly sending people to fight for the Taliban, recruiting people. So, so the Stockholm bomber, who was an Iraqi Muslim who come to university in Luton, was a nice young man till he come to Luton. Then, mm -hmm. then, when you're vulnerable at your most vulnerability, away from home for the first time, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in university, they pounce. And yeah, they, that's, that's typical cult that, behaviour. This is what, that, so they pounce. Yeah. Yeah. And they got him, and then he went and blew himself up. Yeah? So these groups have been operating. So I organised a protest called Ban the Loot and Taliban. Yeah? Well, I actually, in my pres I gave a presentation at Oxford University. When was that? That was 2004. Mm -hmm. So I gave a presentation at Oxford University because I made leaflets. And if you dig up the leaflet, which I've done for my Oxford University presentation in 2004, my rhetoric has never changed, okay? <laughs> so the leaflet was put as front page of our local newspaper. And what I said is, whites and blacks are being religiously and racially targeted in this town, yeah? No one's doing anything about it. There's a total two-tier policing operation in this town where they get away with what they want. The Islamic community get away with what they want. They don't, the police do not know how to deal with these problems. I went on to say that they use drugs as a weapon against our community to get our children into paedophilic practices, which is what's now known as grooming. 
Now, when I made this, when I, and, and I was a young man, yeah, and I organised it with my friends, we go to football together. Um, I'm, Luton's one of the most, it's, it was voted, voted the roughest town in Great Britain. Yeah? Mm. It's a rough place. But we what went makes it rough? Um, they were hat makers. What we were hat makers. What made you rough? That's all that mercury. <laughs> that's the history. Oh, of maybe. Yeah. Luton's a, it's a poverty-stricken town with a lot of problems, regardless of Islam. Mm -hmm. Luton has a lot of problems. It's, it's a rough environment. It's, the levels of violence are, are as high as anywhere in the UK. But what you grow up thinking is normal actually isn't normal. Mm -hmm. yeah, you, you grow up with a level of violence in your school, on your streets, or the way to solve things is through violence. And it, it, it's mm -hmm. a poor town, yeah? So I, start, I, I organised this group. About 200 of us turned up, English men. And for the first time, it worked. That, the terrorist group weren't there. Yeah? The, the jihadists weren't there that day because we were coming. Yeah? And the police locked it down. But the, what happened from that point... The police... The, tell me what they did. No, the police, on this day, the police turned up. We went, to, we went to Don Miller's. The group weren't there. We then stood, held a little protest at our council building, saying we need to get rid of these terrorists. Yeah? This was before 7... In the aftermath of the rally, the debate over immigration policies remained heated. Supporters of the protest argued that it was a necessary expression of legitimate concerns, while critics warned of the dangers of fostering division and intolerance. The rally highlighted the complex and often contentious nature of the immigration debate in the UK. It also underscored the power of grassroots movements and digital activism in shaping public discourse and influencing policy. In conclusion, the big rally against migrants in London was a significant event that brought together thousands of people united by their concerns over immigration policies. The protest highlighted economic, cultural and social issues reflecting deep-seated frustrations among certain groups. The role of social media in organising and amplifying the rally underscored the evolving nature of activism in the digital age. As the debate over immigration continues, events like this rally will likely remain an important part of the conversation, influencing public opinion and policy decisions. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below and for more content like this, be sure to subscribe to the channel.